couple of questions for you before we get started. Okay. Since you are uh, one of the more veteran um, uh, yogis here in Los Angeles. Uh, Sorry to say that's true. <laughs> you were in a monastery for yeah, four years? I was a monk in India. I had no intention of being one. I was actually a rock and roll musician traveling around the world with these big bands. And then I met this one particular guru in, in uh, Australia and had this uh, outrageous experience with him. And I just followed him and ended up in India. <laughs> and that was radical. And you're also the author of Happy Yoga, yeah. which is the premise of that being it's a what? <laughs> Unhappy yoga. Yeah, yeah, I wrote that. And I, I heard a rumor. This this may or may, may or may not be true, but I've actually told the story before, so I hope I hope it is partially true. <laughs> you somehow are responsible for Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now, getting into Oprah's hands. Yeah, I uh, I brought him actually to Maha Yoga. The first time I brought him, no, the book hadn't been released, so there were like forty people. And the next time I brought him, it was. 110 people, and then we rented the Agape Church, and it was 1,500 people. And then I gave his book to Oprah <clears throat> because I used to have a yoga show on one of her TV stations. It's a long, boring story, but anyway, he, um, that you know uh, skyrocketed his career. I should get a finder's fee for that. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, I'm gonna let Steve take it away, everybody. Steve Ross. Close your eyes. Give me a break. There we go. And just be in the moment as much as you can. Bring yourself into the room. You might want to take a deep breath and just release it. The goal of all meditative techniques is to bring yourself into <clears throat> accessing your fundamental nature, which is inherently blissful, happy, peaceful, intoxicated. And the only reason you don't experience that all the time is your mind. The mind is socialized and enculturated from a young age, and you miss out on it because the mind is so fragmented and impulsive and conflicted that you miss what underlies and what permeates it. And that which underlies it and permeates it again is blissful. That's your nature. It's not something you need to achieve after long practice. It's your nature now. You just don't see it because the mind is busy. So for a moment, at least, just let the mind settle down. If thoughts arise, it's okay. It's the nature of the mind to move. The good news is, you're not the mind. You're the one aware of it. Forever untouched by the play of phenomena on it. So that awareness is prior and senior to all manifestation, all creation, all phenomena, is constant. The only thing that doesn't change, everything else, thoughts, emotions, situations, people, places, and things, change. But that awareness, which is your essential nature, is eternal, untouchable, consciousness itself. So there are many different meditative techniques. They all point to the same thing, which is to bring the mind to one point. And by doing so, excluding and relinquishing all thought and all fragmented meditation, you start to get subtler in your awareness, and that subtlety 
collapses in on itself, consciousness collapses in on itself and reveals itself as unbounded and blissful. And that's experiential, has nothing to do with what you believe. You can believe anything you want, even better, nothing. But it's all about experience and meditation. So in this moment, the only moment that actually ever is, simply be. You're not trying to become anything. You're not trying to change anything. You're not interpreting the moment in any way. You're not indulging likes and dislikes, opinions for or against. You're simply aware of the moment in its totality. without interpretation, without commentary, allowing the moment to be exactly as it is now. If thoughts rise, so what? What are thoughts? Thoughts are just a play of consciousness. Chit Shakti Vilas, it's called in Sanskrit. dive into the depths of meditation and you really access what you are. It's so overpoweringly blissful that it shatters your mind forever. You're never the same in the best possible way. Because all the conflict, all the struggle, all the fear leaves you. And what's left is based on conditional reality. It's your fundamental native condition. So in this moment, again, just allow it to be as it is without superimposing your mind and its labels on the moment. You're simply innocently perceiving busy, or emotions are busy, turbulent, agitated, it's okay. Just be aware of it. If that's what is, allow it to be. Whenever you allow everything, the conflict goes out, because happiness is a function of acceptance. suffering hinges and rests on wanting things to be other than they are. If that want isn't there, if that craving for something else isn't there, you're naturally content. You don't need anything or anyone, and when the need goes away, then you can really enjoy
you out somewhere, just gently bring your attention back to, again, the innocent perception of that locale. There may be sensation, there may be lights. <clears throat> Whatever happens on the level of phenomena is less important than just holding your attention there. Your eyes closed, but take a deep breath and release it. Just stay relaxed. Nothing to do. Nowhere to go. Nothing to get. Ideally, you can be simultaneously aware of the external objective world in the terms of your senses, <clears throat> the sound, the temperature, etc., and aware of your internal world, the subjective world, at the same time. When you're aware of both at the same time, Forget all that. <clears throat> One more deep breath. Let it go. I'll tell you a quick story and then we'll get out of here. The first time I went to India, I was there many, many times, but uh, I went to a place called Rishikesh, which is northern India, the foothills of the Himalayas. And <clears throat> I used to go in the early morning and sit on this rock that faced the Ganges River. It was beautiful. I would just go, you know, take the breeze and watch the water sparkle. And so I went there and one day I was sitting there after I'd been there a couple weeks and I felt this palpable energy, this very powerful energy. And I kind of looked around and I 
saw this orange figure walking towards me. And as he got closer, I saw that he was a, a sadhu. He had his hair wrapped up to here, you know, and um, all in orange. And he had a trident, you know, the symbol of Lord Shiva. And he had ash all over him and big Rudraksha beads. And he was just looking very intense, like the kind of guy you cross the street to avoid in Venice. But at any rate, um, as he got closer and closer, the energy got stronger and stronger. And, and you could feel kind of every pore, every cell of your being start to vibrate and pulsate with this kind of tingly, low-level, orgasmic feeling. So he got closer and closer, and then he looked at me, and he sat down next to me. I didn't know what the protocol was. I didn't speak Hindi at that point, and I didn't really understand what was going on other than I was high. <clears throat> and I didn't want to offend the guy. He had a trident, after all. So uh, I just sat there, and I just meditated, and I just dropped in and got quiet as I could. And as I did, the amplitude of his power was so strong and so overwhelming that it just started to like bubble up in you. It's like stepping in a blast furnace or something. Just every cell was on fire with attention. And when I got to the point where I thought, I can't take anymore. This is too strong. Just it was like, you're just going to blow apart. At that point, he got up, turned and faced me, and he went, Oh. And then walked away. I was blown away, and that's when I thought, I like India. <laughs> I don't get this Santa Monica that often. So, there's my big story. Nice to be in your elevated presence. Namaste. <laughs>